Jesus is spending most of his days in the temple teaching, and that includes a lot of argumentation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who are the sort of temple religious elite. And today seems like no other. In walk the kind of acolytes of the Pharisees, visible in their very Jewish religious clothing. And Andrew and James look at one another, and they're sort of like, okay, here. Here we go again. But then it gets odd, because in walks a group of men in more Roman-looking clothing, the sort of party of Herod, if you will, who really are not friends with the Pharisees. The Pharisees want the Jewish people to lean full into that identity. The Herodians, well, they'd rather parlay power with the Romans. And so, much to Peter's surprise, the, the Herodians walk over and begin to talk to the Pharisees. And the disciples look at one another and then the whole group walks over to Jesus. And Matthew, a chill goes up his spine because he realizes how much trouble Jesus is really causing that these two enemies would unite to come and put him to the test. And so they begin with flattery, which of course Jesus doesn't really care anything about. So they say, oh, we, we think you're so great, yada, yada, yada. And Jesus is like, could you, could you come to the point? <laughs> what do you really want, right? And they say, okay, here's what we want to know. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a good question. Pharisees don't want to pay the tax. The Herodians, they like Rome. They're cool paying the tax. Will Jesus choose to be a rebel in what he says? What will he do? And Jesus, I love it, knows their malice. And he says, show me a coin. And then it gets a little embarrassing for the Pharisees because some Herodian reaches into his pocket and pulls out a denarius that has the image of the emperor on it, which is a graven image, which shouldn't be in the temple. So now the, now the Pharisees are sweating. Their alliance is costing them a little reputation. And the disciples are pretty aghast. You're supposed to trade it in for a shekel at the front door. Jesus, he just picks up the coin of the graven image, and he says, okay, whose image is on it? Everyone's like, yeah, well, the emperor's, of course. Can't you see? Jesus says, well, then you should give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. And it's not an endorsement of rebellion. It's not what they want to hear necessarily. And so pay the tax, says Jesus, and the Herodians smile because that's what they want to hear, right? One up on the Pharisees. Except then Jesus adds to it, and give to God what belongs to God. And now the Pharisees smile because of course you should pay the temple tax too, right? Until they're both not smiling and the penny drops because it's not really about the coin at all. It's about images. The translation, I know you're sick of me saying things like this, but the translation of the NRSV says whose head is on this, but the actual Greek is whose icon, whose image, whose image is on it. Well, Caesar's. He stamped the coin. He thinks it belongs to him, just like he thinks everything belongs to him. But if it's going to work for whose image is on it, then you have to ask what God's image is on. And God's image isn't on the shekel. This isn't a stewardship sermon. Although Jesus does pay his tax and does pay his temple tax, in case you wondered. But no, this is not about stewardship, it's about images. So you have to ask then, whose image, whose image is, who, who, who bears God's image? And if you flip back to the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the Bible, it's us. Humanity bears the image of God. Right? And probably if you've sat in church for long enough, that's not a new <laughs> addition in this scripture. But it floor drops everybody in the room at the time. Jesus has taken this kind of gotcha political question and given them more than they bargained for. Because give to God what is God's is very personal in asking, have you given God your very self? The image of the Holy One rests on you. Have you entrusted to God what fully belongs to God? That's a wonderful, we sang that psalm, you belong to God, right? 
It's the deepest truth of our lives. We belong to God. We don't belong to, to any kind of Caesar who lords it over us or asks us to assimilate. We belong to God before we belong to anything or anybody else. We're God's. The image of God rests on us. But it's not just a personal matter. I mean, I'm not here to relitigate the thousands of pages of spilt ink on what the image of God means. I'm here to give you my sort of thought on that is that it could be multiple things. But I would say the most compelling to me, and you're always free to disagree, is that the image of God on us has a lot to do with relationship. God, the, the Trinity, right? The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, that triune confession is everything in this faith because that makes God relationship in who God actually is. God is actually relationship. The love that binds a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit together. And the love then that overflows for all of the created order. So perhaps to be wired in the image of God is actually to be uniquely relied, wired for relationship with one another and with God. Because then, give to God what is God's is not just about you, it's actually a corporate affair. It's actually about all of us. And so no wonder neither the Herodians nor the Pharisees have much to say, the text says they were silent. Because it's not just about your personal life, like have I entrusted my whole heart and soul to God? Yes, it's also about, if I'm really gonna give to God what belongs to God, I have to care about my neighbors. I have to care about the fellow siblings of the one God and whether their life is making for flourishing or it is not. And so suddenly the compartments we might like between what is religious and what is the public square, Jesus blurs them together. And maybe it makes us as uncomfortable as it made Jesus's first hearers because maybe the compartments work well for us. But we don't live in the Roman Empire. We live in a situation in which we actually have advocacy. We actually have say in our political realm. And what does it really mean to give to God what belongs to God in the sense of making sure that the fellow humans around us are cared for? That is, it is our business why so many people are overdosing. It is our business why there's so many gunshots and gun violence that happens in this city. It is our business why people are evicted left and right for what appears to be very little just cause. Don't mishear me. I'm saying we step into the public sphere. I'm not saying it's about partisanship. I don't give a flying fling whether you're red or blue or some shade of purple. We're actually called to transcend all of that. It doesn't matter who holds power. I don't care what party they're elected from. We stand for the human flourishing of every single person who ever walked the globe. And it is ours to call all of those powers to account. And so the question for us is really, what does it look like together to give to God what belongs to God? To find our own sense of belonging in the realm of the holy and to recognize then that that is the actual citizenship of every person we lay eyes on. Our baptismal covenant says, let's seek and serve Christ in all people. Will you strive to respect the dignity of every human person? What does that mean? What does that look like? And somehow, can we actually rise above the fray of the partisanship debates to do something different for the sake of love and what it demands of us? It blurs the compartments we like. It maybe sets uncomfortably, and maybe we feel as silenced by it as Jesus' first hearers did. But maybe that's the point to think every time we use one of these coins or not, whose image is it? Well, whose image am I? Whose image are you? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but may we give to God what belongs to God.